It's your name. Come on, say we are complete. We are complete in you. We praise your name. We praise your name. Come on, let's declare one more time. Say we are perfect. We are perfect in you. We bless your name. We bless your name. Come on, shout it out loud. Say we are complete. We are complete in you. We praise your name. We praise your name. Sing for upon us. For upon us is the glory and grace. For upon us is your beauty and love. Come on out to hear the clear. For upon us is the glory and grace. For upon us is your beauty and love. Somebody shout. From glory to glory, to glory, you are taking, you are taking us. Come on, declare for yourself. Say from glory, from glory to glory, you are taking us. Let's declare again. Say we are perfect.
some of you want to jump out there, come on, sing, play like David. He's taking me higher, oh, higher and higher, higher, oh, higher and higher, higher, from glory, from glory to glory. He's taking me higher. Hallelujah. Somebody say he's taking me higher. Say he's taking me higher, higher than I've ever been before. Say and today is a new day, and I'm excited because he's taking me higher. Turn to someone and say he's taking me higher. Turn to someone else. Say take a good look. Turn to someone else. Say can you tell? Say I've just moved. Say in the realm of the spirit. I've just leveled up. Turn to someone, say, can you tell? Say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Lift those holy hands. Say, I'm shining, I'm shining, I'm shining. Say, I've risen like an edifice. The Lord has risen me. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord worthy to be praised, family? How about a round of applause for the Lord? And as you clap, just thank the Father. Name those three things that you're grateful to Him for. Lord, you are so worthy, Father. Who are we that you are so mindful of us, Father? But we thank you, Father God, for your love, your love, for you loved us, Lord Father God, so much that you gave your one and only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in the name of Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's everlasting life in your family. That's everlasting life in your finances. That's everlasting life in your body. No more sickness. No more addiction in the name of Jesus. No more challenges in the body. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's continue to praise the Lord.
Somebody shout glory. glory. Amen. Lift those holy hands and just say thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Abba Father. Glory, glory, glory. Worship team, give God the glory for all the things that he has done for us. It is now for uh, the time for the reading of our rap city. If you need a rap city, raise your hand. The ushers will come around and pass out a rap city. And I just want to thank uh, God for this new, this new day because, you know, I believe God has something great in, in store for us today. And I just want to welcome those who, if you're here for the first time, welcome to Message of Peace. And uh, Message of Peace is all about the Word. It's all about the Word, the Word, and the Word. That's all it is. And if you're tuning in and, and watching us from online, welcome. Uh, before we get started into the Word, i just like to open up a word in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for your Word, which is about to be bestowed upon us, Lord. We ask that you open up our hearts and open up our minds to, re to receive what you want us to know and learn about who you are and what you can do through our lives. We ask that you watch over those who cannot be here with us today. We ask that you watch over those who are watching online. Lord, we just give you thanks and all glory in Jesus' mighty name. And we all say, Amen. So today, today's um, uh, da daily devotion is about power over sickness. According to Matthew 16, verses 17 and 18, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and they drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That is just powerful. So... Our theme scripture outlines some, some of the signs of our divinity. One of them is our dominion and power over sickness, disease, and infirmities. Not only do we have power to cast out devils, we have power to heal sickness, sicknesses and cure disease. Jesus made us healers. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 8, Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Notice he didn't say, pray to me to heal the sick. Mm -mm. He said, and Luke 10, 19, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy and shall nothing shall by any means hurt you. He made us superior to Satan. So majority, uh, majorly responsible for of the sickness that people suffer with. Why then are there Christians who are still buffeted by sickness, disease, and Satan in spite of these realities? According to Psalms 82.5.7 gives us the, the answer. It says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. I have said, ye are gods, and all you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Many are ignorant of God's word, as well as, uh, and as a result, they are, they're not aware that they have power over sickness and disease. They're not conscious that they have the divine life. Jesus said in John 10 34 it is not written in your law I said ye are gods Peter calls us partakers of the divine nature second Peter 1 4 Paul says we're more than conquerors Romans 8 37 sickness really can can't and shouldn't thrive in your body because Christ is the life of your physical body the Holy Spirit in you already gave life to and vitalize your body, your physical body. Romans 8:11. Believe and act on these truths today. Hallelujah. So, power over sickness. I have a small testimony. Small testimony about this. About today's daily devotions. 
and this is not to offend anybody but to open your eyes and to open your heart because uh, what I have to say about power over sickness that really speaks volumes when you read and study the Word of God and you know who you are in Christ Jesus so about maybe a year ago maybe two years ago you know in the year of 2019 in the early year of 2020 we all know that we were um, struck with COVID-19 and, and it was all going all over the islands and all over the world most most partly yeah so you know we, we got hit pretty hard but you know we remain strong because of the word and the, the word that's inside of our hearts you know and uh, the the testimony that I have was uh, I work for island movers and we go all over the islands and so forth and in that time and at that moment um, we were still in the COVID season and and the testimony that I have is that I, back then I was a helper um, I'm a helper and I have a driver who's leading and taking charge and going forth uh, from place to place and then and then that driver after work he would go to parties and so forth and then he got struck with COVID and then mind you I am with him and I'm working with him and and all of a sudden the next day I didn't see him to come to work and then I, I got a phone call from my co co-worker uh, he's like Jesse Jesse I got got. I said, what you mean you, uh, you got got? Oh, I got COVID. I was like, oh man, are you okay? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I just got to heal. I just got to uh, fight it off. I got to drink a lot of liquids and so forth. Oh, you got to get tested. And then I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh no, not me. I'm, I don't have COVID. Everything is going to stop right then and there because I'm not going to receive it. I don't have no symptoms. There's nothing I'm working. And then sure enough, the next day that, that I come into work, my, my bosses, my supervisors, my higher ups, they said, oh, Jesse, you need to go get, get tested. I was like, okay. So um, I got sent home the next day, I went and got tested. And then, and then I received a, a within a 24 hour test result kit. And then my test came, came out negative and undetected because that is, uh, the power of the word when you receive that and you hear and say you got something and you know within your body and you know who you are because of what Christ Jesus has done for you you can speak over it and then cut it off right then and there and it was it was it was a pretty amazing uh, thing to watch because my bosses they, they they were going down the line of all the workers who got sick and then it stopped right at me you know, I mean, it's not because of me. It's because I know who is inside of me. It's because of what Jesus is and what the Word of God can do for, for me in my life. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a blessing. So that's my small testimony. Would you like to, uh, um, can, can you uh, say this prayer for, with me? Dear Father, you're gracious and kind. You're righteous, holy just and true thank you for your life in me that makes me more than a conqueror I live above sickness and disease my life is excellent and full of glory I walk in and manifest the dominion of Christ today in Jesus name Amen. So uh, today we have some testimonies going on, and I believe uh, there's a sister in Christ here that is going to share the testimony. Give you a round of applause. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I want to give all praise and glory to God. Um, thank you, Pastor Mom and Pastor Dad, for the opportunity to let me speak and um, share my testimony. Um, my testimony is about me sharing the word with uh, one of my classmates. So we were in social studies, and we were like just talking a little bit, and I don't know where he like says, "Oh, did you know that there's like an, a new island coming up somewhere?" 
And I was like, oh yeah, I know. And then, he was, and then I was saying, oh yeah, isn't there like gonna be an earthquake or something? And then um, he was like, oh yeah, when the earthquake happens, we're probably all gonna be dead. And, and I just looked at him and I made a weird face and I was like, dead? And he was like, yeah, because the earthquake is going to be super hard. We're all probably going to die. And um, when he told me that, I said, die? I'm not going to be dead. I'm going to be in heaven. And then he was like, heaven? So you mean like you're going to die and go to heaven? And I told him, no, Jesus is coming and taking me to heaven. So um, I told him all of that, and he was surprised. And he was like, what do you mean? And then... Um, after that, I told him, have you ever heard about the rapture? And, um, I, and I told him that, and he was like, oh, no, I never heard about that before. And so I, like, searched up a picture on my computer, and I showed him what it's, like, kind of going to look like. And um, when I showed him, he was so confused, and he was like, what is this? And I was like, um, it's, this is what's going to happen when Jesus takes um, us to heaven. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah. And, um... When I showed him that picture, he was like, well, I'm scared. And I was like, um, don't be scared because it's not good to have fear. And he was like, yeah, I already know that. And um, after we talked um, all about that, I, uh, I told him, did you know we we're in the end times? And he was like, what do you mean end times? And I told him, like, um, like the, the people who believe um, and receive Jesus, they're going to hear our trumpet. And um, when that happens, we're just going to be out of here, even before you can even blink. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah. And um, I told him, we're going to be in heaven with Jesus and reign with him for a thousand years. While down here, the people who didn't know him, who didn't receive, who didn't believe, they're going to stay down here. Um, and yeah, bad stuff's going to happen. And then um, after that, we'll all be with Jesus. And then we're going to be taken to Jerusalem. Yeah to Jerusalem and we'll stay with him forever and he was like wow and I just and we just kept talking and um, I have a Bible in my backpack so I bring it out and um, I opened to Revelations and then um, I read the scripture where it says I am coming and uh, I read it to him and he was like wow I'm and he kept just saying I'm scared I'm scared I told him, stop saying that. Um, you know, you have to be careful with your words because whatever you say, they're writing it down in your book. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then he just started laughing. And then um, after that, um, I just kept reading. And then class ended. And we went out to recess. And we went to go talk with our friends. And then he just bring up, guys, I want to go to heaven. And then we were all like, yeah, we all do. And then we just um, kept talking more about it. And he was like, well, what's the difference between a Catholic and a Christian? And I told him, like, a Catholic, they worship Mary more because they believe that when she gave birth to Jesus, that she's the one who's blessed and she should be worshipped. And Christians, we only focus on Jesus and nobody else. And um, he was like, really? That's the difference? And I was like, oh, yeah. And um, uh, after that, he was like, well, when I go home, I'm going to ask my mom, Mom, why are we Catholic for? And then um, after that, he said, uh, is it okay if like, I can change my religion? And I told him, yes, you can. And he was like, yeah, because I don't know why I'm Catholic. I'm just doing it because my parents go to church, and I'm forced to go with them. And we're like, yeah, you can change too. You can change your religion. He was like, but what if my mom doesn't support? I was like, well, your mom can be herself. She, uh, perfectly, she'll start su supporting you, and um, they'll change too. And um, we just kept talking, and uh, after that, he was like, can I borrow your Bible for a second? So I opened my back, and I gave it to him, and he just read through it a little bit. He closed it and gave it back to me, and um, after that, I told him, well, the people who do this, um, of course, they're going to go to heaven. He was like, yeah, and I was like, yeah, that's the only reason why I'm doing this and to make you believe and make you come to church. And um, he told me, well, I'm going to come to your church. And I was like, yeah, you can. I want to invite you. So um, I'm probably going to talk to him on Tuesday and give him a rhapsody and try to invite him to church. And that was my testimony.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. First and foremost, I want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for this opportunity and for life so good and so abundant. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dad and Pastor Mom, for this opportunity. Love you both so much and, and honor you. So, Pastor Mom asked me to share a testimony um, about the individual that I know. And, um, okay, here I go. <laughs> uh, so, I have a friend uh, who has a special needs daughter. And um, mind you now, she's very private and very protective um, because her daughter is of special needs. Um, her daughter is uh, what uh, they call Miss Aloha because she's filled with so much love and uh, she loves people. Um, she loves meeting people. Um, she's very um, active in, in sports uh, despite what her disability is. And uh, this friend of mine had shared, um, I, I sensed that there was um, something going on. Um, and uh, later on, she shared with me that um, her daughter um, was having brain surgery. And so from a child, um, the doctors had been monitoring the growth um, in her brain. And now at 16, uh, that a uh, a uh, tumor has uh, grown quite large and of course uh, the first thing is we have to do surgery um, doctors um, created a team of uh, care professionals um, to move forward with the surgery um, and so it was a challenging time for her very difficult um, in the process of this um, everything came to a stop, not just for her, but also for her daughter. Um, she stopped doing sports. She stopped doing the activities that she loved the most. Um, and mind you now, she doesn't talk. She doesn't speak at 16 year, years old. She doesn't speak. Um, she communicates by sign language and by sound. And so um, this com changed her um, a lot um, everything came to a stop she um, didn't have any interest in activities anymore doctors actually um, suggested that mom stop having her participate in sports just um, because of the fear that sometimes I think people plant um, even doctors and individuals that um, something may, be, may happen to her and right now the goal was to keep her healthy and strong uh, for this surgery and so um, a lot of things had changed during a short um, time and um, mom was challenged quite challenged and it was not just the fact that um, she had to make this decision to move forward um, with the surgery but also um, challenges that she faced um, with family. Um, everyone had their own view and take of this. Um, some either supported the surgery and some didn't. And so um, being that she's so private, um, I prayed upon this because I wanted my approach um, to be a, um, led by the Holy Spirit so that um, she knew where I was coming from and that she would understand that um, what I was going to be asking her was something probably far beyond what her eyes could see and understand. And so she gave me the information and that information include even the, sim the simple things as what is your daughter's name because she was such a private person. So I asked for daughter's name, I asked for the type of surgery, and I asked when surgery was going to take place, and she gave me all of that information. And I took that information. First, I asked her, are you okay with me sharing this information with my pastor and our prayer team, our fourth watch prayer team, our ministry? And she humbly said yes. 
And so I reached out to Pastor Mom and I just shared the, a bit of the information with her. And Pastor、um, included her in our prayer session during Fourth Watch. And so over the last few weeks, Pastor, if, if, if I recall correctly, we have been praying fervently for so many, and、uh, her and her daughter as well. And so last week,、uh, or actually this past Monday, I went into work and、um, everything changed.、Um, she took a, a two month vacation, and、uh, all of that changed because she showed up for work. And I thought, wow, you're here. You're supposed to be you know, on medical leave. And she went on to tell me that the surgery was canceled, it was postponed. And mind you, now we have been praying fervently, fervently in the spirit. And that particular week that the surgery was canceled, she had shared with me that there was just such a peace. There was something that came over her, and she couldn't explain what it was. But something came over her that when the doctors told her that the surgery was going to be postponed, She felt such a peace, but she also felt that it was a sign. Her words were, it was a sign that told me that my daughter didn't need to have the surgery, that she was healed. She was already healed. And so I spoke life into her, and we had a lengthy conversation. And、uh, she went on to tell me that. So, when you're having a major surgery like this, there is a core team that is set in place. And there's a lot of medical staff that is in this team because it was such a,、uh, a major surgery that her daughter was having. And so she knew who was going to perform the surgery, she knew every hand that was going to be touching her daughter. And this is what, what the medical team d o you know, before a major surgery like this. And she said that three days later, that she learned after the surgery was postponed, three days later, she learned that there was a doctor that she had not heard of, that she had not consented to, that was not part of their medical team, that was not part of the surgery itself. This doctor was to perform the surgery. She didn't know anything about this doctor. So, truly, at that moment, I believe that the angels were sent before her and before her daughter and stopped the works of the adversary, dismantled the works of the adversary. But she did not know who this doctor was. And just imagine if that surgery would have moved forth. She would have never known that that doctor was the doctor that was performing the surgery. So, truly, the mighty works of the Lord w a s with her and her daughter. And now she sits in such a place of peace.、Um, she's not looking forward to having the surgery. And as I shared with her, And we've been declaring, you know, and I told her, I said, it is done. It is done. You know,、um, there's no tumor in her head. It's, it's gone. It's completely gone. And of course, they're looking at doing more tests to see where the growth is. But I just continue to speak life into her and to let her know peace be still, that all is well. And so,、um, I celebrate this, you know, on behalf of her and her daughter. And I'm so grateful, you know, that、um, our ministry family, our Fourth Watch prayer team has come together and has truly prayed so fervently for this mom and child and to be able to testify, you know, on the goodness of the Lord, you know, and the grace of Him that abounds. Bounds all. Bounds all. Thank you, family. Thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to share.
Someone shout glory. glory. What is so wonderful to see all your beautiful faces here. We do know that the word of God beautifies you from the inside out. It is about the word, the word, the word. When you have the word in you, you're so confident, I tell you. But you also have the Holy Spirit. Even if you're not as confident as you are, but when you have just a bit of the word and you have the Holy Spirit, I tell you, he will cause you to be catapulted from one level of glory to the next level of glory. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your grace, your love, and your mercy. We thank you in the matchless name of Yeshua HaMashiach. We know that we live each day, Father God, with an attitude, an attitude of worship, and an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude, Father God, you know, of goodness. We know that you have filled our spirit with. So we thank you, Father God, that no matter what situation that we are in, we know that you are in control. We know that we will always be victorious because we are conqueror. We are champions, Father God. You are raising us like that of champions to take our place in this world, Father God. The time is near when you will return to rapture and take your children back home. So we stand firm, steadfast, and immovable. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in us today and forever. We pray this in the matchless name of Yeshua and the saints of God say, Amen, amen, amen. Well, greetings in the matches name of Yeshua. You know, welcome to the month of September. The month of September, it is a month of meditation and at a month of declaration. Meditation is meditating on the word and declaration, meaning you got to use your mouth to speak forth the word of God. That is our month of September, month of meditation and de declaration. So truly, it is a timely word that connects with our message this morning. This morning, morning I would like to touch up on Shaf Tim if I could have our first um, slide up there so that you understand and kind of follow along with me so we should have our slide very soon okay there we go Shaf Tim and it's about judges you know and it's interesting because you know as I'm meditating on the word I'm asking God I said judges I mean what what is it father what do you want me to minister to your children what is that you want to minister to me because if I get it then you know I know that this is something that you want your children to also understand and to learn you see the thing about when we do the word is we study the Old Testament then we take you into the prophetic scriptures and then we try to connect it in you know with the New Testament because everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. It points to Yeshua. And even till today, you know, you've heard testimony, testimony about the rapture, testimony you know, about a healing that is taking place, a healing, you know, brain surgery, and a doctor just appeared out of nowhere. He was not even part of the core team. He appeared out of nowhere and stopped that brain surgery. Truly, that is an angel. If the mom had not met that doctor, truly, he is an angel sent by God. So there are miracle signs and wonder that happens every day, but you have to have the spiritual eye to see the goodness of God, to see his fingerprint in everything. And so Shavtim, which is Judges, and that is what we're going to be going on. So I'm going to take you into the Old Testament and bring you right into the New Testament. Our next slide, I will give you the scripture so you can take a snapshot of it because it's going to be your responsibility now. I can minister the word, but it's your responsibility to go home and to read up on all these. So that's your scripture. So, you know, I'm going to skim right through. So you got Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, and you're going to go all the way to chapter 21. You got Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophetic scripture. It gives you a prophetic word of what to look for in the future. In other words, in the New Testament. Then you have the book of John and the book of Acts. Those are your scriptures. So again, it is your responsibility to read up on these. And if you have any questions, that is where the Holy Spirit comes in. And that is where we are connected. You feel free to text me, to call me, and to ask me questions based on your reading. So again, Old Testament, prophetic word, and then right into the New Testament, we're making a connection. All right. Now, this month of September, it also the month, you know, of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is, you know, God's, you know, Hebraic year. It's a celebration. It is a new year. For us, our new year starts in January, right? But God's calendar 
His new year starts this month of September. It is a month of September also called the Rosh Hashanah because it is the blasting or the shouting of the shofar. In the book of Revelation, it says that when you hear the shofar blow, it is time for us to go home. Okay? So those are signs. So God has holidays that we celebrate because there are significant meaning behind it. And September happens to be a Rosh Hashanah. It is the month of the new year in the you know, Jewish calendar in which they celebrate the new year going into the new year. It's interesting how God's calendar happens before ours. The reason why we celebrate in January is because, you know, the Romans changed our calendar. So everyone used to follow God's calendar until the Romans took over, and then now it's called the Gregorian calendar. So now everything has been shifted. But the question is, would you rather prefer, you know, um, following man's calendar or God's calendar, the original calendar? So anyway, we bring this out because we try to align everything. And if you want to understand scripture, which is the reason why, you know, for me personally, I decided to go back. Because a lot of things that we say is going to happen, it didn't happen during man's calendar. It always happened on God's calendar. And it always happened on his modim, on his appointed days and a lot of his more deem and appointed days it happened on friday saturday ah yeah 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 to glory yes it happens on shabbat many of his blessings and many sometimes not even blessings you know when they don't follow his word right we see things happening right on friday saturday but a lot of the blessing you will see happening on his appointed day glory to god well, with that said, let's go ahead and we're going to tackle right into the book of Deuteronomy. I know there's many chapters, so I will tend to skip over some, but it's your responsibility to go in there and to read. From the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, and we're going to start from verse 18. Okay, so Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verse 18, and it reads... You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with the righteous judgment. So if you have your Bible, please make sure that you have it with you. Read it, um, and you should have our scriptures. Thank you, media, for having that up. So what is this? So, you know, and I asked a question. I said, Lord, Judges, you know, what, what do I need to know? What is it about the judges? You know, and we hear, we see right here, it says, and you shall appoint what? Judges. And you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. So basically here on this one is God is wanting, you know, um, this is Moses. They're getting ready to enter into the promised land, right? We've been on Deuteronomy for like, you know, the past couple of weeks. But now as they're getting ready to enter into the promised land, God is telling Moses, make sure to tell the people to assign judges and officers to the people. They will judge righteously. They will judge righteously. They're getting ready to enter where? into the promised land well all this is very symbolic you know because as we're getting into you know that the new year this is symbolic you know in the returning of yeshua hamashiach to take his people into the promised land you've heard about the you know the sharing of the rapture this morning well this is exactly what this is i thought that it's in a book of old testament it is in deuteronomy but it's a symbolic of letting moses know that moses right this is what what's going to happen you know assign judges and assign officers to the people to judge them righteously because there will come you know a righteous judge that will judge his people righteously and that will take them home he will take them into that promised land so that's where this part comes in on verse 18 so again judges who are the judges listen this here is a spiritual thing it's about you you are to assign judges to your eye gate to your ear gate and to your heart gate and to your mouth gate you ought to put judges on your eye gate what are you watching what are you seeing? Because it matters what you see. It matters what you are watching. If you were here yesterday for our training, you folks were in quite a surprise. 
because there is so much thing you didn't know, but now you know. Your eye gate is very, very important. You are to put a judge on your eye gate, put a judge on your ear gate. Judge righteously. Judge righteously what you see. Judge righteously what you hear. Judge righteously what you say before you say it. And judge righteously what is in your heart. Because what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. And God here is letting Moses know, judge righteously. Before anybody else will say anything, think before you speak. Because you don't have all the information, but you're making judgment. So before you speak, let the Holy Spirit judge what's in your heart, whether that is right. And if you don't have all the information, don't speak. Don't make judgment over things that you don't know behind the scene. So that's where judges come in. You see, God is preparing his people for the day in which the Lord will return to take his people home. The word says that he will return for his bride without blemish, without no spots, with no blemish whatsoever. Why? Because the lamp that was slain had no blemish. And so therefore, as his bride, our brothers and sisters, we're not to have any blemish. Amen? Cool. So that's the part right there. Moving down to verse 21. So verse 21. So verse 21, it's about forbidden forms, you know, our worship. And it reads, you shall not plant any tree as an Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God that you shall make. And you shall not set up a pillar which the Lord your God hates. All right? Go back to, again to the beginning and say, you shall not plant what? Any tree. You shall not plant any tree as an Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God that you shall make. The reason why the Lord says in this part, you shall not plant a tree, because the way that they worship, they would go into the forest, they would have this tree, they would decorate a tree, and they would bring gifts, they would bring goods to this tree, they would place those gifts and those presents under this tree. What does it sound like? A Christmas tree, correct? Ah, yeah, yeah. But it's all in here, because this is not how God worshiped. This is how the people, the pagan worshiper, would worship. And that's when the Lord said, you shall not plant any tree as an Asherah. Okay, so this is like a goddess. So a tree that was planted on behalf of this goddess, and then they would bring all these gifts and all these wonderful goods, even baked goods, and they would place it under this tree and decorate this tree. And then eventually they would start having, later on, you know, um, coming into like, you know, more fast forward, they would put lights on this tree. So the Lord said, do not plant any tree. And the reason why he said, do not plant any tree next to my altar. Because the Lord understand that those who used to worship will remember that. So you don't want that tree to be in a way when you got new converts coming in and then they see that tree and they're like, Oh, they worship that too. We do that too, right? I come, that's how we used to worship. So the Lord is so intelligent. He said, put those trees away, make sure none of those trees. He also said, make sure that you don't have no pillars. So these are stones that are stacked upon each other. Because what they would do, they would worship by having stones, right? And we see that. How many of you see those stones around? Okay, so that's and the Lord said, make sure you don't even stack those stones up because that's how the pagans worship. You know, it's an old name, but, you know, fast forward, they have different name when they stack those stones and they pray to those stones is they're praying to this goddess, okay? Or a god, they have a different god. So everything is very scripture, which is the beauty of why we take it back, you know, to the roots so that you may understand, you know, what we're getting ourselves in. Do know that God hates idols, basically. So not having those tree planted next to the altars and not having, you know, um, stones that are stacked up for you to worship, you know, God hates idols. And one of his rules is you shall not have any other gods before me. And then we move on to chapter 17. So in chapter 17, verse 1, 
Chapter 17, I do apologize if I'm trying to move, but I'm trying to squeeze all this as much as I can. If I don't finish it, then you can go back and read it. All right, so chapter 17, you shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep in which is a blemish, any defect whatever, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. In other words, use only good animals to sacrifice, as simple as that as I will make it. Use only good animals. Why? Because... The reason why God said, you know, when you're going to make a sacrifice, make sure that there's no blemishes, no spots, as I've shared with you earlier, because the lap he is going to send, he's sending you the most excellent and the perfect one without blemish and without spot. And he is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is a perfect sacrifice. Amen? All right, so... Moving on, you know, I'm going to skip down. We're on chapter 17, and I want to go over to verse 14. Verse 14, chapter 17. We're still on chapter 17, but verse 14. If you're there, say amen. All right, so let's go ahead and read that if we have it. Begin. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are all around me. 15, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Verse 16, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. 17. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. All right, let's go back to verse 14. So again, you know, uh, this is Moses. He said, when you come into the land, okay, that the Lord God is giving you, and you are going to possess that land. So you folks should remember this. You see, God is always king, and it should always be God. The problem was that when the people really did, when they entered into the land, God already knew what was going to happen. They were going to want a king because their neighbors, Boundary, had kings. And so they're looking to themselves, well, we don't have any king, but God is king. God has always been with them. God has shown himself mighty and strong throughout the whole journey. But then when they got into the promised land, it was like they just totally forgot about God. And now they were crying out, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. And so now the Lord said, all right, because you want a king, I will give you a king. You are not going to pick the king. I am choosing the king for you. All right. And that's what you see in verse 15. It says, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. All right. So the people I get. So here comes the flesh. We want a king. We want someone to rule us. We want someone, you know, to be there for us and the one that will lead the way. Of course, that really upset the Lord. So he made sure, yep, you're going to get a king. But I am going to choose that king for you. And the Lord said, that king that will come, that I will choose, and the Lord said, that king that I will choose, he will be from among your brothers, all right? He will, he will be set as a king over you. Again, this is very, you know, symbolic and it parallel that God is the one that will choose the king. Just as God chose Moses to lead, so that God will send their king, and that king is Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus Christ. Why? He gave them literally what he said. He said, here, I will choose a king, but the king will come from your brothers. And Jesus came from the line of Judah, from their brothers, the tribe. All right? He said, you may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So the king that he is speaking about in a, about your future king cannot be a king that from a foreigner. So understand when somebody, even to today, when you have a king that says, I am Jesus, but they're not from any of the tribes, that's not king that we are waiting for. The king has to come as a brother from within the 12 tribe. And in this case, Yeshua came from the line of Judah. Amen? 
And then it says that, you know, verse 16, only he must not acquire many horses for himself. You know, the interesting thing about this is that you have King Saul, which is the first king. You have King David, and then you have King Solomon. The first two kings were awesome. They didn't acquire that much horses. But then you have one king that literally did not follow that part, King Solomon. King Solomon acquired so many horses, and he got the best of horses, all right? That went down, didn't go too well. Next one, and you know, verse 17, and it says, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself. We find that King Solomon, also the one that broke that rule, because he had so many wives, many more than King Saul and King David. He had so many wives. And why did the Lord say you shall not acquire wives? Well, because his heart will turn away from the Lord. And his wives were, you know, crying for attention. You know, well, why can't you worship my God? Why can't you worship my God? We were there to support you worshiping your God. So, of course, his heart was tormented and his heart went with his wives. All right? And then the last one, and it says, and his heart, okay, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. So again, a king that you're going to, you know, a king that we're going to bring up is a king that should not be, you know, should not have for himself excessive silver and gold. And the reason why that, you know, the Lord is saying that that king, he shall not be, you know, have excessive silver and gold is because he will get puff up. And because with silver and gold in excessiveness, what's going to happen is that he can easily go to war and, you know, pretty much try to buy off the next boundary, the next neighbor. All right? So it will get to his head. And that's not what God wants him to do. You see, there's a certain level in which, you, and I think there's seven level. By the time you get to the seventh level in which you are already making, you know, um, you're buying, you're buying people, you're, you're going into another territory and you're bringing them in so that you will have many more power, that's when a country starts to go down. And I believe America is in that direction. With excessive gold and silver that is behind everything, you know, and they're at that very level. You see, God had these down to teach us, to train us, to warn us, and to help us. He had it all down so that we would know exactly at what level we are at. And that's what he said, have excessive silver and gold. And again, Solomon had excessive silver and gold. And things didn't go well for him because the kingdom that he ruled, literally after him, there wasn't any other great kings from there. They had kings, but was nothing as good from the first, second, and the third. Okay? Praise God. And then chapter 17 again, we're moving on to verse 18. And it says, the king, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in the book a copy of this law. So the king is required, whoever the new king is, when that individual becomes king, it is by law, it is required that the king himself, he is to write down every law of the Lord. And the reason why he has to write it, because there is power from what you see, and then what comes out from your fingers. Once you release it, it's because there's power that has been released from having to write. He had to write this. A king had to specifically write every law down. He had to copy the laws of the Lord so that it will always be here. He will see it and he will meditate on it. And in the evening, he is required to go over these laws. He also has, you know, um, others that would read to him before he goes to bed. It is required that the law be written, I mean, be read to him. So again, it is a responsibility of the king to write down every law. Okay, and why is that? Verse 19, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes by doing them. So the whole purpose of writing those laws down, getting used to it, is so that there is a reverent fear of God. In other words, be Christ conscious. When you are Christ conscious, you be afraid. You be, you have that fear of not really afraid, afraid that you're going to die, but the reverence fear that you'll be separated from God. 
So he has to write this and so that he will meditate on it, just like our word for this month, meditation and declaration. So he, the king has to write it down. He has to speak these words. He has to meditate on it. He constantly has to have a Christ conscious. And in verse 20, if we can go to verse 20, we could all read that together. Begin. That his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that the many continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. You see? So he writes it down. Again, the Lord does not want any king to be puffed up, to have his heart to be lifted up and to look down upon people. Nope, if he's going to have a king, it's going to be a king who is humble. If he's going to have a king, it's going to be a king that love him, that love his commandment, will keep his commandment. Why would God say keep his commandment? Because his commandment is about justice, and it's about mercy, it's about love, and it's about kindness. So he needed a great king. He needed a good king that would rule in righteousness, in justice, in fairness, and in love and in kindness with mercy. You know, for example, King David, he was one that is so great and reigning. He ruled with mercy and grace. You know, an individual, you know, had owed, you know, um, a man heaps of money. So he would come before the king and he said, I don't have any money to pay him back. I don't have any money to pay him back. And so David uphold the law and he said, well, this is the law. You borrow from him. Now you need to pay it. He said, but I don't have anything to pay back. And he would uphold the law. The law is, you borrowed from this man. Now you need to pay it back. And so, you know, he would uphold that law in that way. So when that young man would go away, and, you know, of course, the one to whom, you know, he owed, you know, he hears that because David is upholding the law. And then when they both would go, King David, who is sitting on the throne in mercy and grace and justice and in righteousness. And then he would look to his men and he said, pay that debt. So they would go and pay that debt to that man in whom they owe. Because this man, David knew, couldn't pay it. But David paid it on his behalf. And so the one that was owing, he can't complain because the debt was taken care of. He can't complain because the debt was taken care of. Well, that's what a righteous king does. And in Yeshua HaMashiach, he is the one that will reign with justice, with righteousness, with love, with grace, and with mercy. That is what a true leader is about. Amen. I want to go over, you know, a slide. Let me show you a slide really quickly. And again, all these things are about a heart issue. These laws were given so that you as kings, that you may reign with love, with justice, with righteousness, with mercy, with grace and what peace. If we could have the next slide up. Okay, so you have justice and it's balance with mercy, loving kindness. Next one. So if you could see that, this is on the king's throne. And I want you because not only does the king have to write it down, but you know, it is said that before the king goes up to his throne, right, and he sits down, there are six steps that lead to his throne. And so when he takes the first step, you know, when he steps on that first one, and then he has a heralder. A heralder is the one that screams out and yells out, you are not to distort justice. And then the king takes the second step, and let's all read it. Do not show favoritism. Then he will take the third step, read. You are not to accept a bribe. He takes a fourth step. You are not to plant any sacred pole near the altar of Adonai. He takes the fifth step. You are not to set up a standing stone. He takes the sixth step. You are not to sacrifice anything with defects to the Lord your God. And then he sits down. But all this is to help him, to remind him that he is serving on behalf of Yeshua HaMashiach until the true king will return. Amen? 
Well, that's something for you and I to look into. You know, you can take a snapshot and practice, you know. Six step, this first step, you can go over thou, right? Thou should not distort justice. So in other words, all that boils down, do the right thing. Be fair, you know. Do it with love. Do it with kindness and so forth. And then, you know, in verse 15, in a verse 15, and this is a new prophet, verse 15, and it reads, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. And this is Moses saying to the people, he's talking to the people, he is saying that the Lord your God, he will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you and from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen. Moses was humble. He is meek. He is gentle. He is kind. And he said, and the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me he was comparing that prophet like him and that prophet guess who he is yeshua hamashiach right and he said i will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and i will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them that i command glory to god well now i want to take you over you know and then really quickly you have chapter Okay, so you have the one with witnesses. Okay, so really quickly, having to do, and we're on chapter 18, having to do with witnesses. So, and this is very important. So if one witness what someone else did is wrong, the word says it cannot be from just one witness. You got to have two or three witnesses. In other words, those two or three witnesses were the ones who actually witnessed that. You cannot go and grab someone and say, can you be my witness because, you know, uh, this person did this. That won't count. You see, the Lord holds it very highly that if you're going to call upon witnesses, it has to be those who were actually there with you when that crime was committed. Not where you take another one who was never there, didn't see the crime, and then you take that witness. No. This part here is saying that when two or three witnesses, it's the ones who were actually there at that moment when the crime was committed or whatever that you were taking advantage of and it happened where those two or three same people were there with you. And what happens is that, you know, once it is done and how this is, so this is really, it's crazy. The very two or three witnesses and if the word is confirmed, it is them that will have to kill that individual. So you see, not only do you bring the witness, but you also have to be the one that will stone that individual to death. Okay? Not anybody else. It's those two or three. So because you've solidified, you said, yep, that person is guilty, then the very two or three witnesses are the one to stone them to death. But anyway, I wanted to bring that out to you so that you can have a better understanding compared to what we are going through today. Amen? All right, you guys are all so nice and quiet. But you see, judges, what are we judging? This is a book. It is preparing us that we're going into the new year. You have to prepare your heart, prepare your eye gate, your ear gate, your mouth gate, your heart gate your mind, everything. Let's go on to the book of Isaiah 51. Now we're taking you to the prophetic message. Isaiah 51. You all like, whoo, that was kind of intense, yeah? So now look at what the Lord said in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 51, verse 12. Are we there? Amen. All right? And it reads, I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, who dies of the son of man who is made like grass? So basically, this is a prophetic word. The prophetic word is this. No matter what situation that you are in, if you feel that man has like literally are trying to oppress and suppress you and you can't seem to get away, this is a prophetic word. I am your comforter. Look to me. I am your comforter. Who is men that you can be afraid of? Who is mere men? Mere men that are here today, gone tomorrow. That's what that verse is. So again, God is reminding us, fear no one. 
Have no fear. It doesn't matter how powerful that person is, but the Lord is saying, fear no one. That's a prophetic message right there. In Isaiah 51, verse 12, all the way down to chapter 52, I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies of the son of man who is made like grace? Okay, that made like grass. And have forgotten the Lord your maker. In other words, he said, you've forgotten me when you start to focus on these men that's bringing you trouble. And then you go to ver um, verse 17. He said, wake yourself up. Wake yourself up. Stand up. Stand up, O Jerusalem. In other words, the prophetic word for you is wake up. Rise up and shine. Rise up and shine. Stop having people dominate you. Stop having people suppress you. Stop having people oppress you. Stop having the devil coming over you. Stop having the devil keep turning you around. The problems that you're facing, he said, wake up, wake up. Arise and shine for the light has come. And the glory of God is risen upon thee. Who is mere man that you're so afraid of? Why are you afraid? So the Lord is saying, I am the one that comforts you. I comfort you. So awake, awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your strength. Put on your beautiful garment. And get ready to enter into the holy city. Ay, ay, yeah, yeah. So he says, shake yourself from that dust. Get up. What are you doing there? And then I'll take you over to the last one in the book of you know, New Testament. John 1, verse 19. And this is John the Baptist. And this is a testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you a prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who have sent us. What do you say about yourself? And then on verse 23, and he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Ay, yeah, yeah. You and I are like John the prophet. We are making straight the way because Yeshua is returning back. Be prepared. This month is a month of blowing that shofar. It is a spiritual sound. A spiritual sound, only the children of God that truly that have served him will hear it. And he said, make way. And then you go on to verse 26. And John said, I baptize with water, but among you stand one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He is prophesying. He is declaring that there is one among us and he's already here. Just like you and I, we have been ministering. He is already here. The sound of the shafar, the sound of the blast shall come. Are you ready? Please focus your attention on this video. Lord, it's, it's you. It is. And you are not one of my sheep. What? Lord, I went to church. I know the scriptures. I told people about you. You know how much I gave up? Oh, really? Let's see. Remember all of the times I asked for help and you walked right on by? Remember? I called you from prison many times and you never would take my call.
Remember how many times I would come up to you and I would just ask for something to eat, not even money, just food. Not even money, just food. Lord, when did I ever see you asking for help or walk past you? When did you ever call me from prison? Ma'am, whatever you did for all of those people, you would have been doing for me. Whatever you did not do for them, you did not do for me. You say you know the scriptures. Well, do you remember this verse? Many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, and I will tell them, depart from me. I never knew you. What? No, 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 what? You know, we uh, created that video because, you know, you hear a lot about how we have to get ready because Jesus is on his way, he's coming back soon. And that's true. But God put it on my heart to just say, we could stand before Jesus at any point. We could stand before him tomorrow, next week. We, you, you just never know, you never know. And when we do stand before him, we don't want what happened to her to happen to us. You know, that video may seem like it was a neat presentation, but the truth is that's exactly what the Bible says many people will hear. It says many people will stand before Jesus and will say things like, Lord, Lord, you know, I did this for you. I did that for you. And he's going to look right at them and say, I don't know you. Why? Well, it says it in the scripture. He's going to say, you know, I was needing clothes and you didn't clothe me. I needed food. You didn't feed me. I was in prison. You never visited me. Basically, he's going to say the way they treated others is how they treated him. And he says, you know, the, they will know that you are a follower of mine by how you love one another. The key is love. He's saying so often, that the true mark of being a follower of mine is not just how religious you are, it's how loving you are. And so, you know, we gotta examine ourselves. I gotta examine myself. Because when we stand before Christ, what will he say about the way we treated people? Better yet, what will he say about the way we treated him? something to think about. The Lord, I'm reminded about the QB, um, Derek Carr with the Raiders. And they asked him the question and he said, you know, what do you think of your players? And his response was, when I look at all the players, I see God in them. Likewise, may you see with your spiritual eyes that may you see God, may you see Christ in each and every one of your sisters and brothers. And even those that are outside, you know, of Christianity, your eyes are supposed to see everyone, you know. You have to see the goodness of them, the Christ, the God that is in them. And I believe when you're Christ conscious that it makes it so much easier for you, you know, to love that individual because you're loving the Christ that is in them, the God that is in them, even though they can be very blessed, but there's a goodness in each and every one of them. With all eyes closed, and even those of you who are zooming in or tuning in, you know, to our worship this morning, you know, if you're not yet born again, we'd like to invite you to make Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, as your Lord and Savior by basically praying, you know, this short prayer with me. And I want you to repeat this. Say, oh, Lord God, I believe with all my heart in Jesus Christ. He is a son of the living God. I believe he died for me and God raised him from the dead. I believe he is alive today. I confess with my mouth 
that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life from this day forward. And through him and in his mighty name, I have eternal life. I am born again. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I am now a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Congratulations. If you pray that prayer, you are now a son, a daughter of the Most High God. And we would like for you to stay in contact with us because we do have a gift that we want to get to you. And that gift is now that you are born again. If any of you that receive Jesus Christ in-house right now at this moment, you just made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior for the very first time. You know, I want you to lift up your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come. I'm not going to ask you to come up here, but I just want you to lift up your hand so that our ushers will locate you and that they will talk to you after. They will pull you on the side to minister to you and give you a gift. Amen. Praise God. At this time, we're now going to move on to our communion with our ushers. If you have our, all the elements, please pass that elements on to our people so that they will have it prepared as we move on. You know, reading from the book of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, and it says that the Lord Yeshua, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. If I could have my element, please. And then on verse 24, thank you so much, sir. And then he had, he had given thanks. So you would have yours. And he took it and he gave thanks and he broke it, saying, take, eat. This is my body that was broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and pray over it. Barukata Adonai Elohenu, Melekatlom, Homet Leket, Mit Halet. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who prepared this bread for us. Go ahead and receive it. And first Corinthians verse twenty-five. And so if you just made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, partake of this with us. Even for those of you who are tuning us, because you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, partake with us with these elements. The bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for you. Okay? And then, you know, the, the, the blood represents his blood that was shed for you. Okay? And 25, and after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood. Do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Let's go ahead and pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of the universe, who create the fruits of the vine. Go ahead and receive it. Go ahead and meditate on what the Lord has done for you. His goodness that was shed upon you. Meditate on it. Thank him for all that he has done for you your family and up to this point and worship along with us. Yeah, you will crush 
Pastor, for your word, and thank you for the message that you have bestowed upon us. God has truly blessed you with the word. And so right now it is our tithes and offerings. If you need an envelope, would you please raise your hand, and the ushers will come by and give you an envelope. So as, as the, ushers are, the ushers are giving out the envelopes, uh, what did we learn today? We, we learned about the power of... Um, God's word, you know, as far as um, the word, and um, you know, it's like, like when you, when when you hear the word, it comes out of you, and and you know, you bring it to bring it into life, you know, like like sister, the sister in Christ testimony about uh, sharing about bringing another brother in Christ, uh, you know, knowing. And, and also just just believing, yeah? And so, anyways, uh, let me pray over, over your, your tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the message that you have uh, blessed us with, Lord. We ask that uh, you bless, bless the hands, bless our jobs, bless our families. Watch over us throughout this new week, Lord. We just give you honor, praise, and glory, and we give you thanks. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Go ahead and rise to your feet as we declare this song over you. I'm blessed. 
as we conclude praise the lord praise the lord make sure nobody's left out grab the hand of your neighbor as we conclude Okay. 